I hope everybody uh, had a, a wonderful night's rest last night and that you had a great breakfast this morning in order to give you the nourishment that you're going to need to endure my extended three-hour presentation that begins now. <laughs> Boy, aren't you glad that was a joke? Uh, whatever uh, Kenneth was saying a moment ago, you know, when, the, when your brain matter starts moving into your glutus maximus and the only thing you can think of is, I have got to stand up, uh, that's when your brain starts shutting down and you can't hear the speaker anymore. When I was a pastor, I learned that it is way better to uh, finish speaking and always having an audience thinking, wow, that could have went a little bit longer, than to always having an audience thinking, wow, that could have ended a little bit sooner. Isn't that right? Well, in any case, words. We've been hearing such wonderful words, haven't we? Over the last day and a half, powerful words of instruction, of encouragement. And I'm saying this because words in and of themselves are powerful. Did you ever think about that? Words are powerful. Words can build up. They can encourage. They can educate. They can inspire. They can heal. But we also know that words can tear down, they can destroy, they can diminish, they can discourage. How many of you have ever experienced that in your lifetime? They can suck the life right out of you. They can end marriages. They can ruin governments when at the executive level words begin to pit us against God himself, which is happening right now. Words are very powerful. And so whether it was Demosthenes speaking before the Roman Senate in 330 B.C. in delivering what is considered today to be the greatest oration in the history of mankind, the Dacarona on the crown, or whether it was me standing up here before you last night pretending that I actually had something to say, words can be uh, powerful. And uh, the amazing thing about words is that they also are not, the power of them is not measured by the number of syllables that it takes to phrase them. Do you know what I mean by that? How many times in history has history witnessed uh, men and women who, because of their academic instruction, should have been masters of their wordcraft and capable, and yet they failed to inspire in their generation? And yet at other times we saw common people, sometimes so common, they could hardly put together enough words to form uh, a sensible sentence. And yet because of their passion and the ministry, what we would say is because of their anointing, they changed generations, they changed nations. So the power of words is also not contained in the number of syllables that it takes to phrase them. And I have a comment for Kenneth. Is Kenneth still in the room? I wanted to tell him something. I told him to, uh, yesterday uh, when I first met him, and you'll understand this comment in a moment based on something him and I were talking about up here before the uh, conference actually officially began. I told him that I was going to tell him something about the phenomenon that is going on on the top of my head at this very moment uh, to illustrate uh, the power of words. Uh, I could describe it, Kenneth, in three ways. Number one, that I seem to progressively possess no follicle appendages upon the cutaneous apex of my cranial structure, posterior to the landoil suture and anterior to the surgical suture, upon which said follicle appendages habitually germinate. Or I could say, number two, that I seem to be becoming progressively glapus. Or I could say, number three, that I'm going bald and every 10-year-old in the building would know what I'm talking about. Now, I'm saying that because Ken up here, oh, almost crossed the sacred line. Ken up here yesterday was showing me the glory on the top of his head. Then comparing it to mine and complaining that Sam the cameraman would have to do special things with the lighting to keep from lighting up a little too much on the top of this thing and making you think you're having a close encounter of the third kind. <laughs> Words are powerful. In addition to that, symbols are powerful. Did you know that? Especially to the occultists, symbols are very powerful. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about words and symbols. I want to talk to you about dates and all kinds of mysterious things uh, like that. I want to qualify some of this uh, in a moment. This is something for which I've been interviewed 
by U.S. congressmen, including Congressman Bob Ney, by U.S. senators, including U.S. Senator Rod Grams, by the History Channel, by dozens of radio and television shows, and even by members of the 33rd Degree Free Council themselves, and they have not refuted one time uh, what I want to talk to you about today. I brought this little uh, watch up here to try to help me. It never does seem to help me, but it seems at this moment I have about 45 minutes left. How in the world have I been talking for 15 minutes? Somebody rip me off already. <laughs> kind of like that Baptist guy that bought that Pentecostal dog in yesterday's joke. Well, anyway, before I get to that, you've seen these all over the nation. Uh, Noah Hutchings was uh, pointing this out yesterday. Uh, tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific times, so evidently that's about 9 p.m. your time, the rapture is going to happen. Followed by the greatest earthquake in the history of man and the beginning of the Great Tribulation period. So says Mr. Camping, the multimillionaire owner of Family Radio. Have you seen these all over the place? Well, we're going to find out tonight if he's a prophet of God or if he isn't. Uh, he wasn't last time around in 1994 when he made the same predictions, but he guarantees us he's got it right this time. In fact, he's got it so right that the Bible guarantees it. Pastor Hoggard, I have never been able to get the Bible to guarantee any prediction I ever made. So where, what's the deal, man? How do I up my grade with God? I want a guarantee. If I could get a guarantee, I'd start making a whole bunch of predictions right now. I'd predict that I'm going to get wealthy because you're all going to feel sorry for me and give me a bunch of money. How many of you think it's going to happen? It ain't going to happen. So um, does that mean I'm not a prophet? Well, I don't know. I don't want to make fun of this, man. I really don't. Could the rapture happen tonight? Surely it could. Yes, it could. Could have happened yesterday. Might happen next year. Kind of reminds me when I was pastoring uh, in 1987. Hey, my house, mine and Nita's house, burnt down to the ground in January of this year, but we got a wheelbarrow worth of stuff out of it before we lost everything else. Among the ministry uh, little things that I had kept, I had a little uh, book, a little booklet, Noah. And let's see if you can remember this. It was in 1987. This booklet was called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Occur in 1988. How many of you remember that? <laughs> and I was pastoring, and people in my church want to know what I thought. I said, well, why wait till 88? How come not now? How come not the year after? And then in 1989, since it didn't happen, he wrote a book, I think, called 89 Reasons. I didn't keep a copy of that one. That one should have been called 89 Reasons. I was wrong in 88 Reasons. Uh, but it was 89 Reasons, and then that one didn't happen either. Bottom line is this kind of stuff goes on. I'm making this point to tell you I want to talk to you today about uh, dates and things like that, 1776, 2012, and a possible secret occult connection to those numbers that could be prophetic. And I want to begin talking about this by making a couple of points. Number one, I do not set dates. How many think that's a good idea? Number two, I do not put other texts on a par with the authority of the Bible. How many think that's a good idea? Uh, I'm very much a Hoggard-type disciple. Well, I'm a Jesus disciple, but I'm a Hoggard-type preacher. Uh, I still preach from a King James Version of the Bible. The one that I had preached from for 30-some uh, years burned up with my house, but uh, Bob Ulrich, a prophecy in the news, gave me this a big Bible here. It's big enough to choke a mule, so it made me happy. Uh, and uh, so now I'm preaching from that one. And I am a, a literalist. I believe that the Word of God is inspired. And I believe that it is immutable. And I believe that there is no other book on the face of the earth that can be compared with the authority of this text. And I believe that it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and can pierce to, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And if I don't get quiet, then I'm going to turn into Hoggard and start preaching. So I'm not going to do that. That's his job. This is my job, to stand up here and talk about dates and try to get myself in trouble. All right. Uh, so, I don't put other texts, because you're going to hear me referring to some ancient texts that are not in the Bible. I'm referring to them because I believe that there is an occultic force. I do believe there are occultic forces in the world against which we conduct spiritual warfare. And we are in a battle for the mind of a generation. I said that last night. Part of that battle is being waged right now in a New Age movement that is centered around the year 2012. 
12. And even many of our own pastors and Christians are being caught up in the excitement about this year 2012 and are trying to interpret biblical uh, uh, prophecy based on what they're reading out of the Mayan text and things like that. That's what I want to talk about today. Uh, I also believe that these forces can be powerful. Do you believe that we war against occultic forces? And do you believe that they also sometimes can be powerful? They can be persuasive. Timothy gives us that example uh, where Moses with, withstood by the uh, Egyptian magicians Janus and Jambres. And Moses is sent by God to go and stand before Pharaoh and he takes a rod with him. And he, and he gives him uh, miracles to support uh, God's demand that he let his people go. And if he doesn't, this plague or that plague is going to happen. And yet here are these magicians in ancient Egypt who can mimic most of the miracles that are performed by God at the hand of Moses. They can be very powerful. We also learn in Revelation 13 that when the Antichrist and the beast appear, they will have the power to call fire down from out of heaven at their command. Occultic forces are in the world. They can be very powerful. And here is the mystery. They also seem to know something about times and dispensations. And that is quite a mystery. The example I give there is where Jesus went into the valley of Gadara. And uh, the wild men of Gadara, the homosexual men of Gadara, come running up out of the caves. Demonism, Noah said yesterday, always tends to lead to homosexual behavior. It is one of the uh, most blatant assaults against the creation of God. That would, if, if led to its logical conclusion, would actually lead to the eradication of all mankind, at least men as we know them. But in any case, these demoniacs come running out of the cave and they say to Jesus, what have we to do with these? Jesus, thou son of God, art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And this is the Greek word kairos, which means a fixed time, an epoch that is waited for. In our terminology, we would call it a dispensation. And for you pastors and preachers that are here, there is a fantastic sermon here waiting for you to preach it because, number one, they know something about times and dispensations. Secondly, they knew that that time had not yet arrived. But thirdly, they know when it does arrive, guess what? The king of kings and the Lord of glory is going to judge uh, the dead and the living. He is the one that has the power. I could tell you a story of a demoniac that I don't have time to tell. Uh, it was the only case when I worked with a team of exorcists some decades ago, but it was the only case when, in which I ever saw actual laws of physics being broken, things that I simply could not understand. A young man running towards us and leapt through the air and hit an invisible wall, literally just slammed into something and hit the ground. But this was the cool part. The minute that happened, there were 40-some people who were standing there. Every single one of them fell to their knees and raised their hands. You know why? Because for the first time in their life, they saw undeniable proof that there is a God in heaven and seated at his right hand is a man by the name of Jesus Christ and every principality and power must bow before his authority. These powers know something about times and dispensations. All right, because of those points, they're in the world, they're powerful, they can be persuasive. They are warring to control what decisions that are made by pharaohs, by presidents, Egypt's pharaoh is our president. They are warring for their mind. They want to control them. They want to take them somewhere. They want to take them, obviously, in a direction opposite of what God would have, either that executive level or even the people of that nation follow. Uh, and slowly, the, 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 the process of gradualism, the drip, 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 where over a slow period of time, we are taking away from preaching the Bible, Pastor Hoggard, that fantastic point you made last night. When you change the DNA, you change the body. And the body in this nation has been changed. The church is dying. We are no longer reaching uh, uh, tw 25 year olds and younger have had their worldviews more shaped by Star Wars movies and George Lucas and Hollywood than they have by the church. And uh, so they're persuasive and that's what they're out to do. They're out to persuade a generation but of what? And here is a great mystery. I have to admit to you uh, in the beginning, I had no interest really at all in the year 2012. I just didn't care anything about it. To me, it was just a, a big New Age uh, phenomenon that was unfolding around the end of a Mayan calendar, which I couldn't also couldn't figure out why I would care anything about. Uh, but then something happened. 
I was doing research on something else, and I came across this book, the book of the Kumiel, the council book of the Yucatec Maya. This interested me because the Yucatec Maya had converted to Christianity following the Spanish invasion. And they still technically refer to their prophet as the Chilambalam, but the Chilambalam had converted to Christianity. And the Chilambalam started developing ideas around the Christian final judgment. And he came to believe that the prophets of his culture who were forecasting a future in which their God would return was a false setup for the Christ of Christianity and his appearing and that something was going to precede it. In our theology, we would understand that entirely, wouldn't we? The coming of the Antichrist, the time of great deception. So I came across, this was a, by the way, this was academic research. Uh, the professor here, Richard Luxton, as far as I know, isn't a Christian. He had made himself a friend of the Yucatec Maya, uh, and he was hoping that they would allow him to interpret some of their ancient books into the English language. And uh, so he was doing academic research with the Yucatec Maya. The Maya had written this 500 years ago, and it contains prophecies concerning the future. Um, uh, so I started reading this. Make a long story short, I thought I found something. I thought I found something nobody had ever found before. And I'm not one of these guys, you know, uh, like in the New Testament where they're always running around trying to find some new thing. That's, that's not me. Uh, but I thought I came across something, and it was connected to the year 1776, the year 2012. And more importantly, in my mind, it was connected to the founding of this country and the great seal of the United States and a prophecy held by the Freemasons in which they believe that their God is going to return at a future moment in time. That grabbed my interest. But before before I said anything about it, I, I thought, uh-oh, I have stumbled into some deep occult work here. And these guys are scheming something. And whether I believe it or not, they believe it. And because they believe it, it can affect the course of our nation. It can affect the course of law. When you get up among the elite, the power behind the power. The president stands up and gives a State of the Union address, but it's written by somebody else. And there are people behind him that are fashioning his words, like George Bush standing up and twice in his State of the Union referring to the angel in the whirlwind. And a few weeks later, uh, one of our senators standing before the U.S. Senate and praying to the angel in the whirlwind to take uh, a charge and control of the future of this nation. The angel in the whirlwind is known in Masonic circles. It is, it is Enoch, basically, turned into the most powerful angel in heaven, which is very much central to their occultic and mystical beliefs. That's why I started out saying words are powerful. When people say words, most of the time, especially when it comes from D.C. on down, it means something. And it may mean something, uh, what they call a uh, 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 sato, under voice. They're saying something to somebody else out there, but they think the public is going to receive those words as having a different meaning. It's occultic. And so I thought I found something. So here's what I did. Uh, because I know I'm going to run out of time, never going to make it. Noah's going to start walking towards me with an ominous creep. I decided to send out an email. I sent an email to a couple of dozen of my favorite prophecy scholars because I wanted, you know, there's, there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel. I wanted to know if this was nothing more than just a uh, a fantastic coincidence, or if in fact I had actually found something. So I sent an email, went to Noah, went to uh, Chuck Missler, uh, John McTurnan, uh, Gary Sturman, J.R. Church, just a bunch of people that I respected. And I won't tell you uh, uh, what all of their responses were, but my question was this. Gentlemen, have you ever known of a connection between the year 2012 and the great seal of the United States of America? Now, I didn't tell them what I thought I found. That was the whole email. And I got responses back from all of them. I think Noah was uh, in some foreign country being chased down the road by 400 prostitutes trying to run for his life. <laughs> he had to be here yesterday to understand that. <laughs> <laughs> but he was out of the country. But I got responses back from most of them. And to a man, every one of them said, we know of no connection between the year 2012 and um, the uh, uh, great seal of the United States of America. But then something happened. I got an email from J.R. Church. And by the way, if you don't know it, J.R. Church went to his eternal glory. Uh, he lost his bout with cancer. He is in the presence of the Lord. And if the rapture does happen tonight, he's going to be grinning because he went ahead of all of us. You know that, don't you? The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And he's just going to be laughing, hollering, catch up if you can. Well, in any case, I got an email and then J.R. called me. And he said, Tom, he said, uh, I got your email. 
Uh, I don't, first of all, I don't know of any connection between the great seal of the United States and the year 2012. But, he said, and this is where the worm started to turn. He said, did you know that in the uh, ancient Zohar, the 700-year-old Zohar, which is one of the most important books of Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, magic, uh, he said, did you know uh, that besides, you know, their uh, commentary on the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, that in a section called Vieira section, which includes a subsection called Signs Heralding Mashiach, that is, the coming of the Messiah, he said, did you know that these ancient Jewish scholars 700 years ago predicted that their Messiah would arrive in the year 2012? 700 years ago. I said, I had absolutely no idea. I did not know that. I'd never read that, never heard that anywhere. He said, do you have a copy of the Zohar? I did. I had an electronic version. He said, open it on your computer. He opened it on his computer. We both sat there on the phone. He took me, read me through. And the reason I had read past this is because obviously it's in the Jewish calendar. It's in the year 73, what is also called 5773. But in our Gregorian calendar, that begins in the new moon in the year 2012 and ends a year later in 2013. 13. And it was this fantastic prophecy. And uh, look at what they say here. In 2012-2013, the kings of the world will assemble in the great city of Rome. This is important. And the Holy One will shower on them fire and hail and meteoric stones until they are all destroyed. That prophecy goes on to then say that the, from that point forward, the Messiah will begin to make himself known to the nations of the world. Why, why might this be important? Because the Orthodox Jews rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, and in our theology, they are prophesying the coming of the Antichrist in the year 2012. And whenever he comes, they are going to accept a false Christ. Do you understand that? Why this was important to me was because as J.R. was reading me through the Vieira section of the Zohar, what was ringing in the back of my mind was an even older prophecy, an 800-year-old prophecy that was also made by what I consider to be an occultic figure, a Catholic mystic. A man by the name of Malachi O'Morgare, also known uh, more commonly to the Catholics, Father Malachi. And Father Malachi, 800 years ago, went to Rome to provide an update on his diocese to the uh, Pope. And while he was there, something seized him, according to the story. Something came on him, and he began to write down what is now uh, famously known as the prophecy of the popes, in which he listed every pope that would ever exist from the first to the last, beginning at Celestine II to who what he called Petrus Romanus, Peter the Roman. But look at what he said about Peter the Roman. He'll arrive during a time of tribulation, and then the city of seven hills will be destroyed, and the terrible judge will judge his people. So an 800-year-old Catholic saying almost exactly the same thing as 700-year-old Jewish mystics, they were prophesying the coming of their Messiah, who in our mind is the Antichrist, this guy is prophesying the last pope, the 112th pope. Well, guess what? Benedict XVI is the 111th pope. The very next pope, according to this prophecy, is Petrus Romanus. And last week, people were arrested who were applauding to assassinate the pope. At any moment, you could have the fulfillment of these pagan prophecies. Now, I don't put these on a par with the Bible, but why was this, why is this happening? Why did one culture... Jewish mystics believe their Messiah would arrive in 2012, and a Catholic, and by the way, even some apocalyptic Catholics believe that the final pope will be the false prophet of apocalyptic literature, that the false prophet on this side will point the world's religious communities to the political figure on this side who is the Antichrist. And you're seeing the culmination of two, uh, one 700 years old, one 800 year old prophecies that are coming to pass at this very hour. Well, what happened then was a pattern for me begin to emerge. And with my background in exorcism, this had special interest to me. Uh, I wondered, what are, what are these spirits up to? What are they doing? What do they believe? Since spirits know something, both the good ones and the bad ones seem to know something about dispensations, what are they plotting? 
That's what I, you know, this kind of started turning in my head based on partly what I'll show you again in a moment from the book of the Kumiel. But so I decided, all right, I'm going to do a little bit of research. Ultimately, by the way, this research led to the book Apollyon Rising 2012, which you can get in support of Southwest Radio Church's ministry, and you can read a lot more about a lot more of this in that book. There's also a series called The Lost Symbol Found, which was when Dan Brown came out with his book, The Lost Symbol, talking about a Bible that is hidden in the base of the Washington Monument, we spent six hours explaining why there is a Bible that is bound in a stylized magic 666 square in the base of the Washington Monument and what that mysticism means from their own Masonic writings. So in any case, something began emerging to me, and I, had a, I was curious about it. I'm curious George. I'm curious Tom. That's, sorry, that's me. I've always been kind of a stinker as a little boy, and when somebody said, don't go there, I went, oh, see what I just did? I crossed... And don't think that I haven't been spanked by God plenty of times so you don't need to come up and rebuke me. In any case, I, I thought a pattern was emerging. So I kept digging. I found Monument 6 in Tuartacuero, Mexico. This is the only monument that tells what the Maya themselves, the ancient Maya, what they believe is going to happen at the end of the Mayan calendar, at the end of the 13th Bakhtun that ends in the uh, uh, month of December 21st in the year 2012 when their calendar ends and then rolls over and starts again. Uh, and Monument 6 tells us that when that moment arrives, their underworld god, Bolon Yakteku is going to return, followed by nine support gods that represent the planets uh, in, our, uh, in our planetary system. And I don't know where Noah went, but Noah, it sounds just like they're describing an invasion of Earth, like a giant UFO, because all of a sudden something descends very rapidly upon the Earth. Is that going to happen? I don't know, but I know that the Bible tells me men's hearts are going to fail them for fear for seeing those things that are coming upon the earth. And there is a time of great deception and a time of lying wonders that could cause the world to accept what? An intergalactic Messiah, the return of the gods, the return of the Sumerian god, something that could be extraordinary beyond our comprehension that could cause the masses of the world to panic and fall down in subservience to what we think of as the coming of the Antichrist. Anyway, that's what Monument 6 says. So I started looking into other cultures. I wanted those. It just Mesoamerican. I found out that the Hindus had focused on the same thing in the Hindu Kali Yuga calendar. This is the age of the male demon and it ends in the year 2012 and they too saw that the earth would go through catastrophic changes then I found here in the early Americas 200 years ago the Cherokee Indian tribe in a whole series of apocalyptic prophecies uh, they too began to prophesy and as a result even the Cherokee Indians set their calendar to end in the year 2012 with the return of their feathered uh, rattlesnake god. These are called the Cherokee Star Constellation Prophecies or more commonly the Cherokee Rattlesnake Prophecies and here's another thing for you uh, investigators that like looking into this stuff. I want somebody to answer me why all of these cultures who are focused on the year 2012 and the return of their gods want to typify their god as a great dragon that has the power of flight, has the power to move through the air. The Bible talks to me too about a power of the air and also refers to him as a dragon. And all of these cultures, the Cherokee see a flying rattlesnake god who's going to return. The Mayans see Kukulkan. The Aztecs see Quetzalcoatl, their feathered uh, serpent god coming back from the heavens. And furthermore, as you'll see in a moment, on the great seal of the United States, the prophecy on the great seal speaks of the return of the god Saturn's reign over the earth and his son Apollo uh, upon the earth. And if you look at ancient depictions of Saturn, he is pulled in his chariot through the sky by two winged dragons. All of this, all of this occultism looking to the year 2012 and somehow tying in to that day. How much time do I have? Uh, do I honestly have 20 minutes? You've got 33 minutes. Glory. <laughs> you like that Baptist glory? The Baptists don't say glory, they say glory. <laughs> so I went back to Luxton's book. 
this uh, interpretation of a 500-year-old prophecy, the book of the Kumiel. Now, let me just real quickly, because I really got some stuff here I want to be able to say, and so I'll move through this part quickly. The point that grabbed me in this was that the Maya had recognized a direct link between the number 13, which is so important to our country, 1776 and 2012, in cycles and illustrations in a way that uh, academic Luxton thought mirrored prophecies of the Christian last judgment. They mirrored prophecies of the Christian last judgment because the Chilam Balam had become a convert of Christianity. And he was speculating about what, all of the, what does all this Mayan stuff mean to him now as a Christian? It is pointing towards the coming of a judgment that is defined in the scriptures in which there is going to be a clash between the powers of paganism and the powers of God. But here's what Luxton wrote concerning Katun 13 Ahu. Katun 13 Ahu is the final 13-stepped countdown of the Mayan calendar ending in the year uh, 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 2012, but it began in the colonial count in 1776. And he says the traditional theme of agreement is the end of the Eastern Katun cycle in 13 Ahu is intermingled here with elements of the Christian last judgment. Whether this paradigm also was intended for the end of the long count in 2012 is open to question. Let me go quickly. When I read the Mayan translation by Luxton, here's what struck me. These elements, the final 13-step countdown of the Mayan calendar began in the year 1776, followed by 13 steps, ending in the year 2012 with the return of their God. The minute that I read that, I said, that's describing the symbolism on the great seal, where in Roman numerals you have 1776, you have a 13-stepped uncapped pyramid, and numerous American historians have told us that those steps represent periods of time which end in the year 2012 according to the uh, Mayan cartoons, having began 76. And by the way, in the Mayan calendar, the end is also the beginning. I know it's confusing. It ends in 2012. It also starts again in 2012. That's the way their calendar rolls over. Uh, over which is this ominous eye of Apollo, known to the uh, Egyptians as Osiris, known to the Sumerians as Gilgamesh, known in the Old Testament as Nimrod. And that, too, is verified by all of the best academic work of the Freemasons as well as American historians. That's not a disputable fact, and it's not Tom Horn's opinion. That's what that eye represents. Combined here with uh, the statement Anawet Coeptus and the prophecy Novus Ordo Seclorum. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment, but, but, but bottom line was this. When I thought I found this, that was why I emailed my favorite Bible scholars and said, is there something here or isn't there? Is this just a fantastic coincidence? Because if it doesn't really mean anything, I sure ain't going to devote any time to trying to figure out what they were trying to say. So my first question was, were the framers of our government, and, and in particular, those esoteric-minded gentlemen who were important to the design and layout of Washington, D.C., and iconic things such as the Great Seal of the United States. Now, don't get me wrong, there were Christians in the founding of our country. And especially at the, uh, uh, at the common level, uh, as a, a result of the Pilgrim Movement, this was a Christian nation. This was a nation filled with Christians. But there were also, among the leaders of this nation, those who belonged to the secret orders. That, too, is a fact. And uh, especially those who were responsible for the design and layout of Washington, D.C. As a matter of fact, you can go to the, our government's own website and read about the contest that was uh, initiated for the design of Washington, D.C. And look at what our government records tell us about the different uh, architect, uh, architectural firms who offered different kind of designs for, for Washington, D.C., and then read on our government website about how Thomas Jefferson didn't prefer any of them, rejected all of them. Why? Our records say because he wanted the U.S. Capitol to reflect the uh, Roman pantheon, and it even says in our government records, uh, uh, dedicated to all pagan gods. That's what they wanted. So that's what they shepherded, and that's what they got. And that's why you have a, a dome and an obelisk. And if we have time, we'll talk about that's why D.C. is laid out the way it is. That's why these elements made it onto the great seal of the United States. Well, what I wanted to know is, were these same mystical-minded gentlemen, were they aware of the beliefs of the Maya? 
and the beliefs of the Aztec? Were they aware of it? And if they were aware of it, did they incorporate it into their belief system? And especially did they incorporate it into the symbolism of the Great Seal and other uh, important elements of Washington, D.C.? That's what I wanted to know because I thought if I could find concrete evidence that in fact they were aware of it and in fact that they incorporated it into their belief system, it might raise my suspicion about the design on the Great Seal, right? So uh, to make a long story short, let me tell you a little story. There's a man by the name of Constantino Brumidi. Brumidi became the official government painter for Washington, but Brumidi cut his teeth in Rome where he did work for the Vatican, where he restored uh, frescoes and important uh, uh, ancient Catholic churches. Brumidi, when French occupied Rome, uh, Brumidi migrated to the United States. He became a United States citizen. He immediately went to work for the... Um, uh, no, that, that's going to make me crazy. Um, anyway, the Jesuits. Thank you. You didn't say it, but you looked at me just right, and Jesuit jumped into my mind. Are you a secret Jesuit? No. <laughs> he went to work for the Jesuits. Well, the Jesuits in New York City were considered to be the power base of Rome's interest in America at that point. They were very interested in making sure that they played a role here in early America. The Jesuits were here to do that. Well, Brumidi suspiciously left the Vatican, came here, and went to work for the Jesuits in New York City. And in 1854, abruptly... The Jesuits and the Freemasons financed a trip for Constantino Brumidi, the famous Greek-Italian artist, to travel where? To Old Mexico. For what reason? To make copious notes of the Aztec calendar stone that ends in the year 2012. Upon the completion of that task, he returned to Washington, D.C. He went immediately to Quartermaster General Montgomery C. Meigs in Washington, who was the supervisor over the construction of the dome and the wings of the dome. He was immediately commissioned to become the official U.S. government painter. He moved inside the, the uh, halls and the rotunda. He began painting frescoes that are Freemason in design. They have very mystical and pagan uh, important uh, qualities to them for, uh, towards the mystical beliefs, the metaphysical beliefs of the Freemasons. But ladies and gentlemen, of all things, if you were going to paint a frieze of American history, of the tens of thousands of things that you could have painted in the famous frieze of American history at the base inside uh, the U.S. Capitol Dome, what does he paint? Nothing else but the Aztec calendar stone that ends in the year 2012. And there are so many important elements, by the way, in the, American, uh, the freeze of American history that send secret messages back and forth to the Freemasons that we could spend 20 hours, I'm not joking, just going through these paintings and pointing out different things such as Montezuma's hand gesturing down towards the sacred fire, which is encircled by that serpent that's going to return in 2012. The sacred fire also goes out in the year 2012. Here's what some called an Aztec drum, but notice that it has the shape of a Maltese cross, which is the symbol that is connected in history to the empire of Osiris, Apollo, who began on a Malta. The Maltese cross, of course, for those reasons, was important to the Knights of Malta, connected with Freemasonry, and the Vatican, where Brumidi began uh, his work and found favor. But there's somebody hiding here in this image in your U.S. Capitol Dome. He's hiding right back here behind this seated and standing Aztec figure. If you look at the Stone of the Sun, or the Aztec calendar stone that ends in the year 2012, as it might have originally appeared as it was painted, this little guy that's hiding in the U.S. Capitol Gone with his tongue sticking out at the world is the god Tonatiu. Tonatiu is the god who demands human sacrifice. In fact, according to Spanish and Aztec records, more than 20,000 living human sacrifices per year had to be offered to Tonatiu, who is going to demand the same on his return. In fact, in the year that they were uh, celebrating the reconstructed uh, temple of the sun god, uh, the Aztecs, according to Spanish records, sacrificed over 80,000 humans that year. A constant line of human sacrifices being sacrificed very quickly, once I had evidence that the designers of D.C. and the Great Seal did in fact understand and adopt Mesoamerican beliefs, I wondered, 
Did they intentionally incorporate those prophetic ideas of Maya Aztec with their own Gnostic and Rosicrucian and mysticism? Or were they unknowingly influenced by the occult power that seemed to be operating behind so many other ancient societies? Societies separated by time and distance. Some of them by hundreds of years, some of them by thousands of years. Some of them by hundreds of miles, some by thousands of miles. Cultures, most of whom we have no evidence that they had any ability to pass oral history one to each other, and yet all of them, for some reason, who worship these dragon gods, aiming towards the end of their calendar as the return of when their God will return and the earth will enter into a new age of elevated mankind. Most of them also, by the way, uh, would speak in terms in their own mysticism as I was talking about last night. We are heading towards a time where men are going to become demigods according to the transhumanists, but they say the same thing in their own language. Man is going to be elevated. We're going to have a new golden age. The gods are going to return, and men with gods are going to be blended. It's all part of their prophecy. Well, was it? I don't know. Uh, how, how do I do this very quickly? Is it part of the reason the designers of the great seal included so many prophetic symbols on the seal? And why put openly hidden prophecies on America's highest seal anyway? For those who are not aware of these prophecies, I don't have time to go into all of it. This is a statement. Anawet Coeptus, this was taken from Virgil's Aenid, in which Ascanius, the son of Aeneas from conquered Troy, prayed to Apollo's father, Jupiter, or Saturn, Zeus. Charles Thompson, the designer of the great seal, final version condensed line 625 of book 9 of Virgil's Aenid, which reads Jupiter Omnipotus Adasibus Anoet Coeptus, or all powerful Jupiter, favors the daring undertaking. He uh, concise that to Anoet Coeptus, he approves our undertaking. I asked the question in the book Apollyon Rising 2012, was Thompson instructed to do that, to conceal the true identity of the he of the great seal, the, fa the mythical father god Jupiter who gives Apollo life? Uh, I'll bet you that the majority of the people sitting in this room, the women in their purses, the men in their wallets, or at least a very large number, have this prophecy in your wallet. It's on your U.S. $1 bill, thanks to Roosevelt and Wallace, 32nd degree mystics, who believed the prophecy on the Great Seal, this according to Wallace's own records. Uh, was a prophecy about the coming of the great architect of the universe, also known as Osiris, also known as Apollo, also known in the Bible as Nimrod, and they believed that his coming was soon and that it would be heralded by a new breed of humanity. Now remember, their contemporary uh, uh, enemies out of Hitler had been hoping for the same thing, the Aryan Superman, the Ubermensk. We are going to create a new form of man. And they believed that prophecy was coming. Well, guess what? They were probably right. It is coming. And now our technology has caught up to our mystical dreams. And we are about to give birth to a new form of man. But was he, uh, did he hide this? Because when you look at your dollar and it says, in God we trust. Who do you think that's talking about? Is that the God of the Bible? Well, you know, if you, if you read, by the way, what caused the great push in America to get placed on our currency, the phrase, in God we trust, that's not really what they started out wanting. It was Christians. And they had actually said to Congress that uh, in a hypothetical annihilation, this is their language, a hypothetical annihilation of the United States in the future, antiquaries of the future would have determined that America had been a pagan nation based on the symbols of the great seal and the way Washington, D.C. was laid out. Even the old-timers knew this. And they wanted something in our government that would reflect that widespread Christian view that was held among the mostly agrarian communities at that time. And uh, it was opposed by the Freemasons. It was opposed by the President of the United States. They did not want something saying, we are a Christian nation. And they finally compromised and put in God we trust because of the ambiguity related to that phrase and that in some hypothetical annihilation of our country and somebody wanted to determine who is the God that's being talked about on the Bible, every symbol on our dollar would tell them it is Osiris. It is the ancient God dying and resurrecting God. It is Apollo. It's he whose eye is hovering above the uncapped pyramid. That's exactly who you would determine uh, this God was talking about. Well, here's the Novus Ordo Seclorum. That is a prophecy. It's taken from a prophetic line in Virgil's Ecologue 4, line 5, Magnus Abint 
Integro Seclorum Nascitor Ordo, the interpretation of the original Latin being in the majestic role of circling centuries begins anew. If I have time, I'll explain that. That is a prophecy of the Cume Sibyl, uh, who predicts the arrival of, uh, in the end times of a divine son. But who was the Cumane Sibyl? Well, she was the most important prophetess of Apollo. She is the most famous of the Pythians. Uh, a prophetess, uh, uh, a Pythian, by the way, is what the Apostle Paul cast a demon out of in the New Testament. When in Greece and Macedonia, and it says that the custom there was to go out in the morning and make prayers. You remember this story? And Paul and his entourage went out to make prayers. And every day the Bible says that a damsel, that is a young woman, possessed with a spirit of divination would follow them around and say, these men are from God. They've come to show us the way of salvation. Now, interesting question. Why would a demon-possessed prophetess of Apollo do that? For the same re reason the New Age movement quotes from the Bible. By the way, when e I can tell you this. I know this from experience. Whenever these spiritual forces know that they have come up against a power greater than they are, that's you, in Christ, and, they, and you're in their community, they won't try to defeat you. They'll try to make the community somehow think they're somehow joined to you. So, but you know why? You, you're a fisher of men. Well, believe me, they are too. They are fishers of men. These spirits are fishers of men. And so they will join or, or try to make the appearance of having joined in order to draw people away into mysticism. And it's happening right now. Uh, I've never seen a day in my life. Why do I talk about this kind of stuff? Why do I talk about UFOs? Why do I talk about what is the occultism operating behind the year 2012? Because I pastored for 25 years. I was an executive in one of the largest evangelical uh, uh, organizations in the world for a decade and I have never seen a time where the world is asking more questions that the church is afraid to talk about. Amen. For every Southwest radio church that will tell you the demonism or the angelology or whatever that might be operating behind UFOs, there is, a, there is a million other churches who wouldn't touch the subject with a 10-foot pole. And the young people in their uh, churches that are asking those questions are then going out and they're asking people that are part of the New Age movement. They want answers. And if you won't answer their questions, they're going to find an answer to their question. That's why this woman was following the Apostle Paul around in the hope that after they leave the community, they could pretend they too were some part of this great power and they could somehow build up and reinforce their position in the Apostle Apostle Paul got sick of it and done what any good Baptist preacher would do. He cast the demon out of her in the name of Jesus Christ. And guess what? Came out the same hour. And yet for some mysterious reason, the Kume Sibyl is in the Sistine Chapel at the Roman city, the Vatican City. And she is holding a, a position here of honor among the Old Testament prophets. Michelangelo, who made the famous paintings there in the Sistine Chapel, he left a secret behind that I've never heard anybody ever talk about. I'm going to show it to you right now so you can follow up on, a, on your own. But he, he, uh, Hoggart, he left us something here very important. Count the digits on the left hand of the Kume Sibyl. Now her thumb is inside the book just like it is on this finger. And then you count her digits, one, two, three, four, and the fifth one is bent under or cut off, which could have even more significant occultic meaning. She's a six-digited prophetess. wonder why Michelangelo did that, because that dates back to the watchers. That dates back to the offspring of those rebel angels that rebelled against God. But it also directly connects to Apollo, who is known as Nimrod, and the fact that he probably was an offspring of the watchers. If we get time, we won't have time probably, but if we get time, I'll show you in the Old Testament book of Genesis where it says, and Nimrod began to be. And the uh, Hebrew word there is giborim. Nimrod began to become a giborim an offspring of the watchers. Well, anyway, there she is. And yet, 
This uh, woman who is held in the sacred place of honor there at the Vatican City, uh, what is it that her prophecy that's contained on the great seal of the United States of America, what does it say? Well, the divine son who comes of the Sibyl's prophecy is to be spawned of a new breed of men sent down from heaven, what we talked about last night, as he receives the life of God since he's heroes with God's commingling. This is taken directly from Greek mythology where there was a marriage of the gods and mankind giving birth to the demigods. This is, watch your technology. This is what we're going to do in our technology. Now, let me give it to you quickly. Here's the prophecy that's encoded on the great seal. Am I talking too fast? Uh, the great seal. Now, the la this is the prophecy that's on the great seal. Now, the last stage by Kume Sibyl Sung has come and gone, and the majestic role of circling centuries begins anew. That's where uh, we take the phrase, a new order of the ages, the Novus Ordo Seclorum. Okay, what's going to happen when this new world order is born? Justice is going to return old Saturn's reign. Bible scholars will tell you this is talking about Satan. Uh, Saturn is the equivalent of Satan in biblical theology. Uh, is going to return old Sa uh, Satan's reign with a new breed of men sent down from heaven. Only do thou at the boy's birth, in whom the iron shall cease, the golden race will arise. Befriend him, chaste Lucina, tis thine own Apollo reigns. So now we know who is prophesied on the great seal of the United States to return. This is from which the prophecy is taken. He shall receive the life of gods and see heroes with God's commingling and himself be seen of them. And with his father's worth, that is Saturn's worth, he will reign over the world. Assume thy greatness for the time draws nigh, dear child of God, great progeny of Job, that is Jupiter or Zeus. See how it totters, the world's orbed might, earth and wide ocean and the vault profound, all in rapture of the coming time. All right, very quickly, there are a few elements here you need to understand. The Greeks believed in four ages, right? You remember this from school? There was the golden age. This was the age when the gods reigned upon the earth. Uh, after the gods departed, we entered into the silver age. This was the age of the demigods. This was when only those who had been born of the gods, what you would think of as the Nephilim, the Gibborim, the offspring of the watchers, this is when they were upon the earth, the silver age. Then the flood came, wiped out most of those bloodlines of the gods, the Greeks believed. Uh, and then we entered into the bronze age. This is the age where there are still some elements of the bloodline of the gods on the earth, but not not very much. And in Christian theology, we look at this and we say, well, you know, the flood wiped out the giants, and yet, lo and behold, how did this happen? After the flood, somehow, they're back. How did they come back? I believe there was a high level of technology that was used that's also going to be used uh, in our age, but that's my theory. There's other kind of theories around this. J.R. Church talked about the bloodline of the Antichrist and the tribe of Dan. Other people tried to figure out, but bottom line is they came back. Somehow the giants were on the earth again, but not in the great numbers that they had been before. This is the Bronze Age when there's very little of the divinity of the gods from the Greeks' point of view uh, left in humanity. And then finally we enter into the Iron Age. That's the age that we are in now where there is so little divinity left inside humanity. What do we got to do? We got to create a new breed of humanity. Exactly what the transhumanists are saying now, the mystics of old were saying the same thing, the day will come when we will need to rejuvenate, recalibrate, alter, re-engineer humanity so that once again we can be an offspring of the immortals. But why should Christians care? about a Sibyl's prophecy on the great seal heralding the return of Apollo because the Bible identifies the god Apollo as the same spirit verified by the same name that will inhabit the political leader of the end times new world order. Second Thessalonians, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of Perdition, this is the Greek word apollyon, which is the Greek's way of saying what we call Apollo. Apollia, apollyon, Apollo. Revelation 17, 8 ties the coming of the Antichrist with the return of Apollo. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into 
perdition, apalia, apollo, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. This phrase is held by many theologians to, uh, b- uh, who believe that it pointed to either a spirit or a personality that existed on the earth, was dead at the time or gone at the time of the writing of Revelation 17.8, but who will return in the latter days to either be or to possess the Antichrist. Both the Bible and ancient records and the prophecy on the great seal tell us it is Apollo. He is equivalent to the Egyptians as Osiris. In the Old Testament, he is called Nimrod. If we had had time, we would have talked about this question, but how could Apollo, Osiris, Nimrod possibly return in flesh or spirit as Antichrist? But it has to do with the Kume Sibyl's prophecy of a new breed of men and the same thing that I was talking about. Well, there it is, Genesis 10, 8, and Cush beget Nimrod. He began to be, this is the Hebrew halal, which means uh, either ritualistically he began to change sexually or to change genetically, or it can flatly just refer to the same thing when the Bible refers to all flesh having become corrupted upon the earth. He began to change genetically, and as he did, what did he become? A mighty, a giborim in the earth. He immediately sets out to build a tower. His eyes were opened, like we talked about last night, to new modes of perception, what the transhumanists want. Suddenly he saw something. He wanted to build a tower whose top would reach into the heavens. Roosevelt and Wallace believed it. Here's uh, Nicholas Rorick uh, holding the sacred casket. Wallace was a devotee of Nicholas Rorick. I went to the house of the temple. I want to know if there was anything to this, so I went to the lion's den. I had people praying and fasting for me. I took my wife. We went to the house of the temple. We went to the headquarters of the Scottish Rite Freemasonry in Washington, D.C. on 16th Street and not on a public tour. We went and met privately with two Freemasons of the 33rd degree order. They took us inside. They answered every question except one. I'm going to tell you what that question was. When we went into the, um, uh, the sacred room there, the chapel, with its giant altar, and I looked up at the 36-paneled magic 666 square that is used during the raising ceremony to bring forth the spirit of Osiris from the underworld to incarnate him in every U.S. president. Uh, when I was standing there, I'm familiar with the, with the raising ceremony. A 32nd degree Freemason becomes a 33rd degree. They go through this process of raising Osiris from the dead to be incarnated within that individual. But what I had been told was that that ceremony was secretly conducted at the inauguration of every United States president, beginning posthumously with George Washington and extending through every U.S. president. And when I asked them if that was true, they would not answer that question. One guy got nervous and walked out of the room. The other one just stayed nervous and stood looking at me. And my wife gave me a look like, don't press it, buddy. (laughs) We prayed going in. We prayed there. We prayed coming out. As I sure didn't want to bring anything with me, if you know what I mean. But I was a man on a mission. I since have talked to U.S. congressmen, senators. I have talked to, I, I stood in front of the Washington Monument with a large crowd in the History Channel filming me there. And we had representatives there from the 33rd Degree Free Council. And I asked them. They would not answer that question. And in not answering it, they did answer it. That the raising of Osiris ceremony is conducted. Why would that be happening? Oh, do I believe that the Antichrist, Apollo Osiris Nimrod, is going to return in 2012? Uh, 2012 might not be anything more than the next Y2K. I don't know if it's going to mean anything. The point is, I think there are some occultists who do believe it, and they have a plan. Um, I believe the greatest conspiracy of all time is sitting out in Washington, D.C. It's also here at the Vatican. This is the ancient uh, structural representation of the womb of Isis. This is the ancient structural representation of the erect male phallus of Osiris. Your capital city is laid out as a magical construct based on ancient Egyptian beliefs for the exact purpose of raising Osiris from the dead so that he could be incarnated within every U.S. president. That's the way the city's laid out. It's also laid out that way at the Vatican. Did you know, Noah, that when Pope Sixtus went and they got this obelisk, they took it from the ancient city of Heliopolis, what is called in the Bible the city of On. It was dedicated to Osiris, Isis, and the sun god Ra. And when Sixtus the Pope brought it there, he tried to conduct an exorcism on it to cast the spirit of Osiris out of it before planting it in the center of the, uh, of the Vatican City. All right, there's a reason why the Washington Monument has a magic square in its base where a Bible is bound. There's a reason there's a magic 666 square above that altar in 
the house of the temple where I was at. There's a reason there are 72 pentagrams in their Gnosticism. They believe 72 demons control the nations of the earth, and they have bound them at the base of the apotheosis of Washington. This is the underbelly of the U.S. Capitol Dome. It's called the apotheosis of George Washington, which means to become a god. What god did he become? Well, look at the heaven that he's rising into. There's not one Christian symbol. There's no Jesus. There's no uh, cross. There is no Michael the Archangel. Every part of the underbelly of the U.S. Capitol Dome is filled with pagan gods. Here's the god Vulcan, who Manly P. Hall tells us fills the Freemasons' hands with the seething energies of Lucifer. That's the heaven he went into at his funeral. Freemasons cast pigs of acacia upon his body to represent that he had gone into the underworld to take his role as Osiris so that the next president could become the resurrected Osiris. Well, the occult have a plan God has a better one, and you better know whose side you're on. Learn more at the future Congress. Here's the most important one. Thank you, Noah, for giving me another three minutes. <laughs>